This is my intermediate algebra course. Today we're going to learn functions and function notation. If you haven't done the homework completely and correctly from the last class, do that homework before watching this video. Um, I've put off functions in the curriculum for quite some time because although functions are uh, pretty easy to understand, the general idea, the notation can be somewhat confusing. So I've tried to put functions off, but uh, we're at a point where we can't really go forward. We have to go ahead and cover these. So um, first, let's talk about the general concept, which again, is not, is not very difficult to understand. A function can be thought of as a machine that uh, processes an input. So here you have your machine. You put your input into the machine. The machine processes that input and it spits out an output. That's a function. So this machine is the function. Some real world examples of this would be, for example, if you're uh, playing a video game and you push a button on your controller, the, the, the uh, pressing the button is the input. That's what you're putting into the, the machine. The machine is the console, the video game console. It processes that input and then the output would be your man on the computer screen jumps or moves forward or whatever the button tells him to do. Another example of this is driving a car. Uh, your parents might be driving a car and they turn the steering wheel, that's the input. The machine is the axles and the, and the, and the, the joints and they process that input and the output is that the wheels turn and the car turns. So those are just some real world examples. So as you can see, the concept of a function is really not that difficult. In math, obviously, uh, we're gonna be dealing with numbers. In math, the, uh, um, the, the function is just a set of operations. That's the green here. And the input is just gonna be a number, of course, and the output is also gonna be a number. So you put this input in. The input is usually going to be x. That's what you put in there. You put in this number here, and the machine, the function, tells you to square that number, then add 5, and then the machine, the function, spits out whatever that number would be. So let's try some inputs for this particular uh, example of a function. And so well, if we plug in 3, the machine tells us to square the 3, we get 9, and then add 5, we get uh, 14. You can see it's pretty easy. If you plug in negative 2 to the machine, square negative 2, you get 4. 4 plus 5 is 9. Very easy. So that's one example. Let's use another example here. Now we have a new function a new machine. This machine is 1 over x minus 1. So let's try put us, putting some inputs into that one. Let's put, put 8 in. Plug in 8. Subtract 1 from 8. And we get 1 seventh. Let's try plugging in negative 4. Put negative 4 in there. Negative 4 minus 1 is negative 5. So our output is 1 over negative 5. Again, very, very simple. The idea of a function is very simple. It's just a machine that uh, that processes an input. So now I want you to try. We have a new machine, a new function. I want you to try putting in 6 and see what you get for the output. <clears throat> if you said that the output is root 4, which then becomes 2, you're right. The output, if the, if the input is 6 for this function, the output is 2. Now try putting in 5 into the machine, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. 5 minus 2 is 3, so the output is root 3. So you're just plugging in the input to this machine and seeing what the output would be. Um, and you can't really do anything with root 3. That, that's, you know, it's an irrational number, so you can't really, uh, it's just gonna, the decimal is going to go on and on, so you just leave it like that. 
Okay, let's try one more of these. As you can see, this is pretty easy, so we don't really have to do a lot of these problems, but we now have a, a new machine again, a new function, and try plugging in two to that function. Now remember, absolute values. At the beginning of the course, we learned absolute values. If you have the absolute value of a positive number, for example, that would just be the same thing, it would just be five. But if you have the absolute value of a negative number, then that turns it, the absolute value symbols turn it into positive five. It always changes a negative to a positive, but it doesn't change a positive to a negative, it just keeps the positive the same. We did this again at the beginning of the, the course. If you're a little rusty on absolute values, that's okay, but see what you can do. Plug in two to this function and see what the output would be. All right, if you got, um, well, two plus seven would be nine, so we have the absolute value of nine plus four. Absolute value of nine is just nine, because remember, if you have an absolute value of a positive number, it doesn't change it. And nine plus four is 13, so if you got 13, good job. Try plugging in negative 19 to this function and see what you get. You can stop the video if you haven't already stopped it. Okay, so negative 19 plus 7 is, um, what would that be, negative 12. So you have an uh, absolute value of negative 12 plus 4. And... Um, absolute value of a negative just turns it into a positive, so you get positive 12 plus 4, and then 12 plus 4 is 16. So if your input is negative 19 into this function, your output is going to be positive 16. Again, we just went over the basic idea of a function. It's just a machine that you put an input into, and it spits out an output. And you might be thinking, well, why are we doing this? What is the point of this? Well, functions are a huge part, huge part, of the math curriculum. You cannot avoid functions, and so we have to do this. Um, it's especially huge when you get into uh, calculus. Your first semester of calculus, if, if, uh, if you don't have a general idea of how functions work, you're not going to get very far. Okay, so that was the easy part. Understanding the basic idea of functions is the easy part. The hard part is the notation. This is where stuff gets kind of confusing. And I'm going to warn you that this can be a little weird. Um, the, the best way to learn it is just to do it, just to do practice problems. So I'm just going to go over some quick things. And I'm going to get through this kind of quickly because, again, in, in, unless you do practice problems, you're not going to understand anything that we're about to talk about here. This is going to be kind of weird. So I'm going to try to go through this quickly and just get to the practice problems. So F is the most common letter that we use to represent a function. If you don't know exactly what the function is, but you just want to give it a name, it's usually called f, f for function, right? Now the input, if you don't know exactly what the input is, it's usually just called x. That's just like a generic name we give for the input, just like we give the generic name uh, f, or we notate it with an f for, for the actual function. The generic uh, name that we give uh, the output is this down here, f of x. Now, notice I pronounced that f of x. This is where things get confusing. You see these parentheses here? Remember, parentheses mean multiplication, right? Not when it comes to functions. We are now going to contradict what we said before in, in previous math uh, courses. Or yeah, uh, when, when you learn operations, you learn that parentheses means multiplication. So now... We have parentheses, but this is function notation. It doesn't mean multiplication, so now we're contradicting ourselves. There are some things, a, a lot of people out there think that the math curriculum is, is everything makes sense. It doesn't. Everything in the math curriculum does not make sense. Okay, it wasn't designed by one person who made everything make sense. It was designed by a group of people who sometimes contradict each other. Some guy came along or some group of people and started deciding that this was now going to be function notation, but it doesn't mean multiplication. So it makes things confusing. But this is such a, a common notation, you just can't avoid, you, you have to learn it. Now, how do you know that this is function notation? How do you know that this uh, symbolizes an output? And, and how do you know when it's multiplication and when it's not? Well, in problems, you're going to be told that this is a function. Once you know it's a function, you know, then you know it's not multiplication. And whenever you see an F 
with parentheses and something inside it like that. It's just, it's always pretty much going to be function notation, you know. So you, you don't have to worry about really confusing that with uh, multiplication. Another problem is, why is, why does, where did this come from? Why are we writing an F with, you know, an X next to it in parentheses? Why are we doing that? Again, this is where things get confusing. It's pretty easy to understand that X is the input. That's not hard to understand at all in terms of the notation. It's also pretty easy to understand that if you don't know exactly what the function is, you can just give it a generic name, F. That's, you know, that's not a big deal. The confusion comes in with this notation down here. Why are we calling the output f of x? What does that mean? Well, the output is given this notation because it tells us what the function is and it tells us what the input was to give us this output. So that's why this, this notation is used. Even though it's really confusing, it, it's it's a notation that's very useful. Now, again, I know that that seems really confusing. You're probably thinking, what in the world are you talking about? Again, there's no way to learn this, this notation until you just do practice problems. But let me show you, um, get, just giving you a general idea of how that notation works. So let's say you have some function uh, f, and you, know, you, don't, you don't have to know what I'm about to show you. I'm just, I'm just giving you the general idea of the, the notation. We're going to get to problems you know, pretty soon here. But this is just showing how the notation works. So let's say you have the function f. Whatever that function is, we're just calling it f, the machine. You plug in 9, and we call the output f of 9. That's the output that is produced when you plug in 9. So it's it's not it's not you know that hard to understand. It's just a weird notation for the output. So the this tells us what it, when we when we t say find f of nine, what we're saying is find the output when you plug in the input nine into the the function f, the machine f. That's why this notation is used. It, it if you say find f of nine. You know, it just means plug in 9 to the function f and, and figure out what the output would be. That's why the function is kind of useful. So here, here are more examples of that. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and jump forward here <clears throat> to actual practice problems because none of that is going to make any sense until you actually do practice problems. So let's just get right into the problems. So it says here, um, if f of x equals 2x minus 5, find f of 3, f of negative 4, and f of 0. So this is actually telling us what the function is. It's telling us the function, first of all, we're calling it f, and it's telling us what the function is. It tells us to take our input, multiply it by 2, and subtract 5, just like we did in the, pre in the first part of the class. No big deal. So they want us to find f of 3, so I'm going to find f of 3. What is the output when you plug in 3 into the function f? And again, please, please understand, this is not multiplication. Okay? I'm going to show you right now what this means. So what we do is we take 3 and we plug it into this thing up here, and we calculate. We process the input. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 minus 5 is 1. There we go. That's it. That's all this is. So we found f of 3. f of 3 is 1. And we plugged in uh, 3 to that x value in order to uh, find, uh, or we substituted 3 for x to find the output. So now let's find f of negative 4. Notice I say f of negative 4. It's not f times negative 4. Okay. Again, this is very confusing notation. We don't mean multiplication. We're contradicting ourselves. Why? Because the math, uh, the math notation doesn't always make complete sense. We do the operations and we get negative 13. So there again, we just plugged in our yellow input into the function 
and we got our output. Our output is called f of negative 4. It's negative 13. That's the output is negative 13. So now we're looking for the output when you plug in 0. So let's plug in 0 to that function, and we get 2 times 0 minus 5, and we get 0 minus 5 equals negative 5. So what is the output when you plug in 0 to the function f? The output is negative 5. So even though the notation is kind of confusing, you can see that the, the basic idea is really not that difficult. The math is not that difficult. This class today is really not going to be very difficult. Okay, so let's try one more of these um, before you uh, try one on your own. So now we have a different function. Notice the function now is 2 to the x power minus 9. Now, a lot of times it's better to change the letter of the function because we already did f. You know, we have f up here. This function is called f. But we should probably come up with a different letter for this function. The most common letters that are used are, are g, um, other than f, that is, g, h. You can really use almost any letter or any symbol for, a fu for function notation, but I'm not going to use any of those letters because I don't want to confuse things. I want to stay with f. I want to try to make this as simple as possible. So even though we already have a function up there defined as f, I'm just going to use f again even though we have a different function. Okay, so it's, it tells us to find f of 2. So we're going to find f of 2. What is f of 2? Well, you just plug in 2 to x in that function up there, that set of operations, the, 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 the machine. Again, this is the machine. And um, this is the, the output when you plug in some x value. So 2 to the second power is 4. 4 minus 9 is negative, uh, negative 5. So again, we plugged in our input. That went into x there. And we got the output, which is negative 5. But the output is, is symbolized by this. That's, you know, that's f of 2 we found. It's negative 5. OK, so I think you probably got the point by now. But let's just do these last ones quickly. Plugging in 3, 2 to the third is 8. 8 minus 9 is negative 1. So if our input is, uh, is 3, then the output is 1, or negative 1. Sorry, my computer's going kind of slow here. All right, so now we're going to plug in, um, what is it, negative 1. We're going to plug in negative 1. Now, this might get a little weird because we have a negative 1 power, but that's OK because we've been doing um, you know, our exponent rules, and I forget what rule it is. I think it's rule number 8 or something, where you have a negative power. You bring it down, and then it becomes a positive power. That's just what we learned in previous uh, classes. Then I think rule number 7, I believe, anything raised to the first power, it, it just doesn't change the number. So we have 1 half minus 9, and 1 half minus 9 would be negative 8 and 1 half. Now, if you had problems doing this, then just go back to my arithmetic course. You know, you don't really need to do a lot of arithmetic for that. You can probably do that in your head. The output was uh, negative 8 and 1 half, and the input was negative 1. Okay, so now it's time for you to try. I'm going to leave number 2 in the window, and I want you to try number 3. We now have a new function here. It's a new machine, so now you have to use this new machine. So go ahead and do uh, part one of number three, find f of negative two. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of negative two, we're going to find that. And to find that, we plug it into, we plug in negative two to our function, our machine, and it processes the input. Negative one plus one, or negative two plus one is negative one. Negative 1 squared is 1. So there you go. Our output was 1 when we plugged in um, negative 2 as the input. So if you got that answer, good job. Why don't you go ahead and try part 2 of number 3, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're going to find f of 5. That means you're going to plug in 5 to our machine, our function. 
and do the operations and we get 36. So when you plug in 5 to this function, that 5 is the input, you get 36 as the output. And again, these blue things on the left here, f of negative 2 and f of 5, that's how you notate the, the output. So if you got that one right, good job. Why don't you try part 3? And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're going to find f of negative 7. That means plug in negative 7 to our function. And negative 7 plus 1 is negative 6. And it just so happens we got the same output as we did in uh, part 2. The output is 36 if you plug in negative 7 as the input. And the output is notated with this f of negative 7. And that's what we call it. f of negative 7 is the output, and it's 36. Okay, um, go ahead and try um, part 1 of number 4. See if you can find f of 0. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're trying to find f of 0, f of 0. So we plug in 0 to the machine. And 0 squared is 0. Um, 3 times 0 is 0, minus 1 half. And obviously that just simplifies to uh, negative one half. And I'm going to stop doing the highlighting because it's uh, making my computer go slow. So if you got negative one half, good job. Now find f of two. Uh, when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So that means you plug in two to the. Uh, <coughs> To the function and it processes it. 2 squared is 4, 3 times 2 is 6, minus 1 half, and 4 plus 6 is 10, 10 minus 1 half is 9 and 1 half. You can write it as an improper fraction or a mixed number, however you want to do that. So if you got that answer, good job. Go ahead and try part 3, and when you come back we'll do it together. All right, we're back, so we're going to plug in 1. So we have 1 squared plus 3 times 1 minus 1 half. 1 squared is 1. And 3 times 1 is 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 minus 1 half is 3 and 1 half. So if you got 3 and 1 half, good job. Again, we're just getting uh, experience with this basic notation. Now you might be thinking to yourself, this seems kind of easy. Well, you're right, it is easy. The only hard part is the notation, this f of x notation. It's very confusing. So why don't you try part one of number five, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of negative three, that's what we're trying to find in part one, f of negative three. So you just plug in negative three into that, um, that function. Um, everything looks right. So negative 3 plus 7 is 4, so we have root 4. And then negative 3 squared is 9, so we have 3 times 9. And then root 4 is uh, 2, and 3 times 9 is 27. And 2 plus 27 is 29, so the output is 29. If you put the negative 3 in, you get... Uh, 29 as, as an output. So if you got that answer, good job. Um, all right, try uh, part two, f of negative six. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're going to find f of negative six. So you plug in negative six, and we do the math. Negative six plus seven is one. So we have the square root of one. And negative 6 squared is 36 and then we have square root of 1 is 1 36 times 3 that's kind of a big number and that would be 108 it's okay to use your calculator for that if you uh, didn't want to do that in your head now we get 109 so the output is 109 so if you got that answer good job try uh, part 3 Try to find f of 4, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of 4, 
is equal to the square root of 4 plus 7 plus 3 times 4 squared. 4 plus 7 is 11, so we get root 11. We can't really do anything with root 11. And 4 squared is 16. So our final answer is root 11 plus uh, 3 times 16 is 48. And we can't really do anything with that expression because, again, we can't really add root 11 to 48 uh, and put it in a compact form. So if you got that answer, good job. Okay, on to number six. Let's try another function. So this is a different machine now. You see we have a different machine. So now we're going to be using a different machine. See if you can find uh, f of eight. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of eight, you just plug in eight. So we have the absolute value of the cube root of eight plus 2 times 8 minus 4. It's kind of a weird function. The cube root, what number times itself 3 times is equal to 8? So x times x times x is equal to 8. What is x? Well, it's just going to be 2. So the cube root of 8 is 2. And uh, 2 times 8 is 16. And so the absolute value of 2 is just 2. And 2 plus 16 is 18, and 18 minus 4 is 14. So 2 plus 16 is 18, 18 minus 4 is 14. And if you got that answer, good job. If you didn't get that answer, that's okay. Um, but now you remember how to do those cube roots and the absolute value. So go ahead and try part 2, find f of 2. Just be aware that the cube root of 2 is, is you, you really can't do anything with that. You just have to leave it the cube root of 2. Um, so uh, try part two, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're trying to find uh, f of two, and we just plug in two to x, and the cube root of two, we can't do anything with. The absolute value of the cube root of two would just be a cube root two, because again, if you have um, a positive number in an absolute value, it doesn't change it, it just remains positive. 2 times 2 is 4, and 4 minus 4 is 0, so we just end up with cube root 2, and that's the final answer. So if you got cube root 2, good job. Okay, go ahead and uh, find f of 1 in part 3, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of 1 is equal to the absolute value of the cube root of 1 uh, plus 2 times 1 minus 4. Cube root 1, what number times itself uh, 3 times? x times x times x is equal to 1. What is x? Well, it's obviously 1. Then the, the absolute value of 1. Well, we'll deal with that later. 2 times 1 is 2. We get minus 4. Absolute value of 1 is just 1. And the final answer, 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 minus 4 is negative 1. So we got negative 1 for the final answer. Sorry, it was kind of scrunched in there. So if you got negative 1, good job. Uh, let's see here. On to the next problem. Again, we're just getting used to the function notation. Uh, you might think to yourself, you know, I've, I've I figured it out. We don't really need to do any more of these. Well, we'll do one more, one more of these particular types of problems because, again, this seems kind of easy, but it's so important to get used to this function notation. We need to keep doing these problems. So go ahead and try uh, part one of this. We have a new machine. See, we have this new machine here. So now we're, not, we're now going to be using this new machine. Find f of 1. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back f of 1, we're just plugging in 1 to x, and 1 squared is uh, uh, 1, and 2 over 1 would just be 2, 
and 1 plus 4 is 5, so we have root 5, and then the bottom we have 9, and that's pretty much it. That's all we can do. We got root 5 over 9. So if you got root 5 over 9, good job. Uh, go ahead and find f of 2 in part 2, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. f of 2 is equal to um, the square root of 2 squared plus 4 all over 7 plus 2 over 2. 2 squared is 4, so we have root 4 plus 4 over uh, 7 plus 1. 2 over 2 is 1. 4 plus 4 is 8, so we have root 8 over 7 plus 1 is 8. And we cannot divide that. That's not 8 divided by 8. But we do have to, we, we do have to pull out the perfect square. If you got to this point, then you got the main idea. But we do have to pull out the perfect square from the uh, from the root. So if you if you don't remember how to do this from previous classes, remember that's just four times two is eight, and then four is a perfect square, so that comes out as two, and the other two stays inside. So you can go back to my root uh, classes if you want to uh, review that. Now two divided by eight, you see this two divided by eight here, that reduces to one fourth. So our final answer, and let me uh, make some more room here, our final answer is going to be uh, root 2 over 4. So there you go. So if you got that answer, good job. This is a more complicated function, obviously, so if you made a few mistakes in there, that's okay, as long as you're getting the main idea. Go ahead and try part 3, find f of negative 2. When you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of negative 2, we're going to plug in our input negative 2 to that function up there. So we have negative 2 squared. And remember, you have to use parentheses there. If you didn't use parentheses, then you're not going to get the right answer. And we should probably use parentheses here, too. You can just write 7 minus 2 if you want to. Um, but just to show, wait a second, I'm sorry, I didn't do that right. That should be 2 over negative 2, like that. Um, it's probably best to put parentheses around this. <clears throat> but I'm just going to leave it out for now. All right, so um, that looks right. Negative 2 squared is 4, so we have root 4 plus 4. And 7... Uh, plus uh, 2 divided by negative 2 is negative 1, so that would be negative 1. And we get root 8. 7 plus negative 1 is 6. And we do the same thing we did before. We just turn that root 8 into 2 root 2. So we have 2 root 2 over 6. And then we just have to um, reduce that fraction. What does 2 over 6 reduce to? If you said uh, 1 over 3, you're correct, so that just becomes root 2 over 3. There you go. So if you got that answer, good job. Okay, at this point, we're going to do the same exact thing, no difference whatsoever, except we're going to learn how to put our information into a table. And it, it's not really that difficult. It's just that you really need to get used to... Um, collecting data and putting it in, in tables because that's that's very common in the math curriculum so <clears throat> this is telling us that if we plug in these inputs what are the outputs going to be that's what that means so notice that the inputs are just like we talked about before the inputs are notated with an x and the outputs are notated with an f of x So what this is telling us, part one here, is it's telling us um, to find f of negative 5. What is f of negative 5? Well, we have a new machine here. It's a new machine. So we're going to plug in negative 5 and just figure out what it is, just like we did before. There's really no difference here to what we're doing before. So 0 is the answer. 
but we have to plug that in. And I'm going to use a different color here to plug in, um, just so I know we plugged that in. So I'm going to use orange there. We plugged in zero. Now uh, it's telling us to find f of negative two. And I'm just going to number these with the, because I want you to know what we're doing here. So that was part one, I guess you could say. We're finding f of negative five. And we'll make this part two to find f of negative two. So again, you just plug in two, same thing we were doing before, or plug in negative, negative two. 10 divided by negative two is negative five, plus two is negative three. So then we have that and we're gonna put it in the table. That's the whole point of this is to learn how to use these tables. And then we're gonna go down here, part three, we're gonna find f of four because it says to plug in, you see this, this four here, it says to plug in four for x. So you plug in four to that function, 10 over four plus two, 10 over four reduces to five over two just to make the numbers easier. There's a lot of ways you could do that. You could change two, five over two to 2.5 plus two is 4.5. You could write it as four and one half. There's a lot of different ways to do that. But you should know all that by now. Um, that, that's just basic arithmetic. So now we're going to take that 4.5 and we're going to put it in the table. Again, that's the whole point of this is to learn how to use, <clears throat> how to fill out tables and what tables are asking you to do. So now we're going to find f of 0. Plug in 0. And at this point, you may notice that something weird is going on here with this. You see that? You can't have zero in the denominator. That's not allowed, remember? Um, whenever you have zero in the denominator, I don't know if we've discussed this in, in this course, but I know we discussed it in my beginning algebra course. You're not allowed to have zero in the denominator. So that's actually undefined. So in the table here, you write, you can just write UND, um, or that, that stands for undefined, but you can also write, uh, DNE, which means does not exist. I, I don't really care which one you write. Um, I'm just going to write undefined. Okay, so that's not going to happen uh, very often that you get undefined there, but I just want you to see what you might have to uh, write if you do get that situation. Okay, on to number nine. So we'll try one more of these before you try one on your own. So this is, this is different because now this table is written horizontally. These are now all the inputs. And notice that that, that row is labeled X because X is, is the inputs. So they label that, they name that row X. And they name this row F of X because those are the outputs. We did the same thing with the previous table except it was just vertical. No big deal. These were the inputs. So we labeled this column when it's vertical, you call them columns. We labeled that column X and the outputs we labeled F of X. Okay, so just be aware that sometimes your tables can be horizontal. All right, so that, let's say that you plug in, uh, well, this is part one. So they want us to plug in negative three. So we're gonna find F of negative three. So we have three minus four times the absolute value of negative three. The absolute value of negative three is just three. Three minus uh, 12 we get, and then it becomes negative nine, so on and so forth. This is all baby mathematics to you at this point. You should know how to do all these operations. We're just showing you how to use the function notation. So that means we're gonna plug in negative nine. That's f of negative three. And so now we're going to find uh, f of zero. It says to find f of zero on that table. So we're gonna plug in zero and just do all the math. Absolute value of zero would just be zero. Four times zero is zero and then we just get three. So then we can put three in the table. Now we're gonna plug in pi. Let's find f of pi. So you're going to plug in pi, 
So we need to find the absolute value of pi. Again, the absolute value of any, any positive number is just, it doesn't change. It just becomes pi. Um, and you don't need to use parentheses. You can just write the, the, the symbol right next to the number. Um, so that's all you can do with that one. You could use a calculator to kind of approximate, but why would we want to do that when we can just write the exact answer? And whoops, I forgot to... Actually, no, I didn't. So that, that, that answer in the table would be 3 minus 4 pi. And now we just have one more to do here. We're going to find f of negative 0 0.6. So plug in negative 0 0.6. 3 minus absolute value of negative 0 0.6 would just be 0 0.6. If it's negative, it changes to positive, remember. And then we get 3 minus uh, 4 times 0 0.6 would be 2.4. And let me find some more room here. And 3 minus 2.4, <clears throat> that would be um, 0 0.6. And you can use a calculator if you really need to on that one or want to. So again, we're just learning how to uh, interpret these tables and how they kind of relate to functions. So I'm going to leave that uh, problem in the window, and I want you to try number 10. So the first thing that we're going to do is if your input is 2, see the 2 down here in yellow, if your input is 2, you're going to find f of 2, what f of 2 is here. So go ahead and uh, find f of 2, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're going to plug in 2 to this new function here. We'll get 3 minus 8 over 4, which is 3 minus 2, which is 1. So if you got 1, good job. But remember, you have to put it into the table. So we're just going to put that 1 in the table. Okay, and now it says find f of uh, negative 1. So I plug in negative 1 there. And 3 minus 8, negative 1 squared is 1. So we have 3 minus 8. And 3 minus 8 is negative 5. So there you go. I'm going to get some more room here. If you got that answer, good job. But remember, we got to put it in the table, so negative 5 goes there. Go ahead and try uh, or find negative 9, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So f of negative 9. we get the following. And that's kind of a weird number to have to calculate. Remember, you can just uh, you can just write this 3 as over 1 and multiply both sides of this fraction by 81. And you get uh, 243 um, over 81 minus 8 over 81. This is just one way to do it. 243 minus 8 is 235. And if you want to, you can change to a, a mixed number, but you don't really have to. That's that's fine. Sorry about that uh, difficult arithmetic there. But sometimes you've got difficult arithmetic, you just can't, you have to deal with it. So 235 over 81, we got to plug that in to our table. And there we go. So if you got that answer, good job. Again, what we're doing here is we're learning how to interpret tables. What's what's the table asking us to do? So now I'm going to keep 10 in the window, and why don't you try number 11? See if you can find f of 0. Part 1 is to find f of 0. When you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So plug in 0. 0 plus 2 is 2. 3 squared is 9, and there you go. So we're going to put that 9 in the table. So let's try 
uh, f of 1. See if you can find f of 1. When you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So plug in 1. So we have 3 to the 1 plus 2 power, which is 3 to the 3 power, which is 27. So if you got 27, good job, but we have to put that in our table. Um, sorry, my computer's going kind of slow. All right, so now fill in the rest of the table. See what you can do for the rest of the table. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. We're going to plug in negative 1. So we have 3 to the negative 1 plus 2 power, which is um, 3 to the 1 power. Remember, anything raised to the 1 power, just it doesn't really change it. So that's 3, and we have to put 3 in our table. And now uh, we're going to find... We're going to fill in the rest of the table. We have to find f of negative 2, plug in negative 2, and negative 2 plus 2 is 0, so we have 3 to the 0 power, which is 1. And so we have to put 1 in our table. So if you got that answer, good job. Now again, you might be thinking to yourself, this is too easy, I, I don't need to do this anymore. But the purpose of this is to get this function notation uh, ingrained in your mind. So we need to keep doing these problems. Uh, now these these are going to be a little different, so we'll do some of these. Um, we'll do these together. So we're going to find f of a. Now this is different because what what in the world is f of a? Well, all that means is that you just plug in instead of plugging in a number, you just plug plug in a letter. So you're going to plug in instead of x. You're going to plug in a. So we have that exact same expression, except we plug in A, and that's it. We're done. We can't really do anything else with that. So I just want you to be aware that sometimes that happens. They they define a function, and they tell you just to plug in a letter. Part 2 is another example of that, but now we're plugging in F of B plus 2. What in the world does that mean? Well, that just means instead of X, you just plug in B plus 2. That's simple. You could expand that. You could raise the B plus 2 to the third power, but that would uh, just make the uh, expression look more complicated, so we don't really need to do that. Um, and sometimes you'll be you'll have to plug in a fraction. I don't really want to give you many fractions because that just complicates things. But sometimes you just you have to do it. So we'll plug in two thirds, and so two thirds to the third power. That's just two thirds times two thirds times two thirds. So that would just be uh, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, and 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. And uh, uh, negative 8 times 8 over 27 is negative 64 over 27. Remember, when you multiply a fraction times a whole number, you just write this whole number over 1. So it's negative 8 over 1 times 8 over 27. And you just multiply straight across. Okay, so let's try one more of those problems because I know that was some of those were kind of weird. So we're going to find f of y. So that means you just plug in y. That's all you do, and you're done. No big deal. Now let's find f of c squared. All that means is you just plug in c squared. Now, there is something that we do need to simplify. Remember, whenever you can simplify an expression, you usually want to do it. And we can simplify this. We know from our exponent rules that we can simplify this yellow thing here a little bit. So remember, when you raise a power to another power, you multiply the powers. So we have c to the second power times 3 fourths plus c squared. 2 times 3 fourths is 6 fourths. And that reduces to 3 halves. We don't have a lot of room here, so I'm just going to do that reduction in my head. And we cannot add those c's together. A lot of students will say, oh, come on, let's add these together. But we, we can't do that. Those are unlike terms. OK, um, now we could change We could change this to, because um, that, that, I think that's the first time we've gotten a uh, a fraction power, and I think I mentioned in previous classes that I won't allow you to keep your answer with a fraction power because it doesn't have any direct meaning. So just to uh, stick with that rule, 
that I gave you, we should probably go ahead and uh, simplify that a little bit more. So let me just change that to, that would be the square root of C raised to the third power. And remember, there's two ways to write that. And then we have to add our c squared. So square root of c cubed uh, plus c squared. And we can go ahead and rectangle that. Sorry, it's getting kind of scrunched in there. So now let's find f of b squared plus 2b plus 6. So as you can see, you can plug in pretty much anything as long as it's a number or it represents a number, you can plug in pretty much anything to a function. So then we get b squared plus 2b plus 6. We're just plugging that whole thing in to that b. So raising that to the 3 fourths, and then we get uh, the same thing over here, b squared plus 2b plus 6. And again, I don't really allow you to leave those as a uh, fraction power. So it's not really that important that we change it right now. We could just leave it like, like we've left it here, but just to, you know, stay consistent with my rule, you never leave fraction powers. So we're going to do uh, the fourth root of b squared plus uh, 2b, 2b plus 6, and then all raised to the um, third power, and then plus b squared plus 2b plus 6. Okay, and so that is the final answer. And there you go. Okay, so I want you to try some of these problems. As you can see, they're not that difficult. See if you can find f of d, and I'll, I guess I'll leave 13 in the window. See if you can find f of d um, in part 1, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So this is pretty easy, f of d, that's just going to be plugging in, plugging in d to that function up there and you're done. There's not really much you can do with that. Now a lot of students would take this and they'd say, I can divide these, d divided by d, that would be 1. Well, you can't do that. See, if you had 2 times d over, over like negative 2 times d or something like that, then you could cancel that out. You could cancel all this stuff out and it would just end up being negative 1. But the problem is, it's not 2 times d it's d plus 2. Or if you had 2 plus d, it doesn't really matter how, how you do it. If you're adding terms, then they're not factors in the numerator or the denominator, so you can't cancel, you can't cancel these d's out or the 2's. So you're basically just done at that point. So if you got that answer, good job. And if you kinda got fooled there and you canceled those out, don't worry. A lot of students get fooled by that. It's, it's okay. You're learning, that's the most important thing. And to also know this function notation. So now we're plugging in this crazy L, L to the 10th minus 2 thing. See if you can do part 2, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So we're just going to plug in L to the 10th minus 2 every time we see an x. So these 2s in the numerator, they cancel out, so we get L to the 10th. And in the denominator, they don't really cancel out, so we'll just get negative 4. And you can pretty much leave it, you know, at that point. That's, that's the answer. Okay, um, so go ahead and try part 3. And when you come back, we'll do it together. That's 3.1. You want to find f of 3.1. So pause the video and see if you can find that. All right, we're back. So now we're just plugging in 3.1. Three point one plus two is five point one, and three point one minus two is one point one. And at that point, I'm going to use my calculator because I don't know what that is, and I don't want to have to do the arithmetic on that. Again, when you get into upper math, you you really just use your calculator a lot. It's it's considered to be fine to use your calculator, and it looks like we got kind of a weird number. So it was a good thing we did use a calculator, or else that would have been kind of weird to do on on uh, using long division. So if you got 4.63 bar, good job.
that means the six it just goes on six three six three six three six three okay so I know what you're thinking you're thinking I've got these I, I don't need to do any more but it's very very important uh, to do as many of these problems as I tell you to do so we need to we're gonna do one more problem here and remember uh, this as I said this this class is pretty pretty simple so instead of complaining that you have to do these problems just be aware that or just be thankful that this course uh, this class wasn't uh, too difficult okay so go ahead and try um, part one here we're gonna find f of negative one and be aware that uh, negative powers you know you got to deal with your negative powers we just finished our exponent uh, classes and you also have a fraction power you're not leave, allowed to leave your answer with a fraction of powers and also here we're gonna have a complex fraction a lot of students get stuck with these complex fractions um, we covered complex fractions in my beginning algebra course and I think we are also covered in, in this course a little bit but if you get stuck you, you know, that's okay but uh, see what you can do with uh, part one find f of negative one half and when you come back we'll do it together all right we're back so f of negative one half we have we're gonna plug in negative one half to x there and we plug in negative one half to x there and four to the negative one half power that has no meaning remember we learned in my previous classes that you have to translate it it becomes one over four to the positive one half that's what that actually means when you translate it now this here there's a lot of different ways to do that but remember a fraction symbol means division so that just becomes six divided by negative one half that's that's the way you can think about it now a one half power means square root that's rule number nine I believe if I remember correctly so that'd be one over the square root of four uh, plus uh, now when you're dividing remember you flip the divisor and you change this green symbol here well actually it's blue because my computer's going slow you change that division symbol to multiplication that would be six times negative two and we can kind of just get rid of the uh, the uh, the fraction altogether maybe I should write negative two over one just so you can see what's what's going on here again this is all basic arithmetic that you should know by now but you know I've taught math long enough to know that even though you should know it that doesn't mean you do know it just about every student has gaps and it's not your fault it's just the way the curriculum works so six times negative two is negative twelve and let me make some more room here so one half minus twelve that would be equal to negative eleven and one half looks like we have a lot of problems where we have one half that's that's just a coincidence so if you got that answer good job now try uh, part two find f of three b and when you come back we'll do it together all right we're back so we're going to plug in 3b and at that point you might you might have stopped and just said well that's all we can do well almost we're almost done um, if you if you got this answer then that's good that's perfect it's just you have to simplify a little bit so we have 4 to the 3b power and then 6 over 3 is 2 so that simplifies to 2 over b and that's pretty much all we can do so if you got that good job okay so why don't you go and try part three and when you come back we'll do it together all right we're back so we're gonna find f of 10 to the a power plus 3a so it's possible we may not really be able to do much because this is kind of a complicated expression so we have 4 to the 10 to the a power plus um, um, plus 3a um, plus 6 over 10 to the a power plus 3a so all we did was we just took this yellow thing here and we plugged it in there and we plugged it in there why do we do that because up here it tells it tells us that if we're using this function we plug it in into these yellow X's up at the top there you see 
And at that point, there's really not much you can do. So we kind of just leave it like that. So we're just, again, learning uh, function notation. Now we're going to talk about a necessary characteristic of functions. Um, as you can see in the yellow here, in order for an expression to qualify as a function, every input that's put into the function must produce only one output. They're probably thinking, what in the world does that mean? Well, these functions down here, you see how this has a plus or minus sign in front of the x? And this has a plus or minus sign in front of the root? What that means is that for most of the inputs that you put inside there, most of these inputs that you put inside, you're actually going to get two answers because it's a plus or minus. You're going to get an output here and an output here. Okay, if you plug in some input here, same thing, because you have the plus or minus sign. Remember, we learned how to use the plus or minus sign quite a bit in this uh, course. You're going to get two outputs. So when you plug in a, one input and you get two different outputs for the same input, that disqualifies these as uh, functions. These circled green machines here, they're not functions. They can't be functions. And that kind of makes sense in the real world. Um, that's just the way mathematicians define it, but it makes sense in the real world also. If you're playing a video game and you push the button and your guy jumps forward, but then he, always, he also jumps back after he jumps forward, you don't want that because that's doing you know, two things at once that are kind of uh, contradictory. There may be some examples where you push a button and it does multiple operations, but you understand what I mean. You don't want your man on your, on your video game doing you know, two different things. You want the button to just do one thing. And the same is true with a car. If you turn the steering wheel on the car, you don't want it to turn right and then turn left and then turn back and right and left. You don't want it doing more than one thing. So that's kind of the idea. You know, how, that's how it relates to the real world. You don't want more than one output for the same input. So let's try some, some inputs just to see why these aren't functions. If you plug in 5, because there's a plus or minus sign, Sorry, that's jumping around for some reason. Because there's a plus or minus sign, you have, you have to do positive 5 plus 9 is 14, but you also have to do negative 5 plus 9 is 4 because it's a plus or minus. So you can see you get two different outputs, and it's the same with this other function over here to the right. You're not allowed to get two different outputs if you put in the same input. We put in 5 and we got 2 outputs. That's not allowed. That's not a function. You plug in negative 1 at the right and you get 2 different outputs. That's not allowed. That means it's not a, it's not a function. It doesn't qualify. So one of the most common problems that you get is where you have a bunch of tables. You see these tables here? And they, try to, they ask you, figure out which one is a function and which one is not a function. And these problems are kind of tedious, they're kind of dumb, but you just, we just have to do them because you see these problems all over in the math curriculum. And so in, it says in the tables below, x represents the inputs. So these x's represent the inputs, and it says uh, y's represent the outputs. Now you might be wondering, how come I didn't put f of x? I thought the input was x and the output was f of x. Isn't that what we've been learning this whole time? How come I didn't write, um, instead of y, how come I didn't write f of x? Well, you only write f if you know it's a function. We don't know if these are functions. These are just, these are just relations, but we don't know if they qualify as functions. If you write, and here's an important point, if you write f of x is equal to, say, x squared minus 3, you're, you're, you're telling people this is a function because you're calling it f of x or f. But if you have something where you just have y equals x squared minus 3, this is not assumed to be a function. It's just a relation. It's called a relation because it's a relation between x and y. Um, now, it turns out that this does actually qualify as a function, but you know we don't know that because it, it's not, we don't write f, we write just y. And we have to prove that it's a, it's a function. But we're not going to do that here. We're just going to use these uh, tables. So it says uh, up here, it says circle the tables that could not represent functions. 
So we want to disqualify some of these as being functions. Um, so the first one, um, well, let, let me see if I can find some that are not functions. Um, so what we're looking for is x value. We're looking for the same x value. So you see here we have 0, and we have 0 again. What that means is that if you plug in 0, you get two answers. You get 9 and you get 1. You plug in one input and you get two outputs. You get both 1 and 9. See, that, that's not allowed. So that's not a function. So we're going to circle that. It's not a function. So what you're looking for is um, numbers in the x column that are the same. And it looks like this next column, we don't have anything that looks the same. But over here, we have 7 and 7. You see the 7 and 7 at the top? If you, if you plug in 7, you get 16, but you also get 5. You can't plug in one input and get two different outputs. That disqualifies it as a function. So there you go. That's, that's number 16. Um, this is a very important characteristic of uh, functions. So let's try number 17 here. Um, I, see, I see negative 4 twice in the x column. I also see 10 twice in the x column. So if you plug in negative 4, you're going to get 2 and you're get, going to get 1. But if you plug in 10, you're also going to get two, two answers for 10. You're going to get 12 and you're going to get 1 third. Both of those uh, uh, facts about this uh, column, they, they disqualify it as a function. So you have to circle that one. That cannot be a function. Over here we have, I can see, uh, negative 3. If you plug in negative 3, you get 17, but you also get 10, so that disqualifies it. And if you plug in 6, you also get uh, 2 outputs, so that disqualifies it. But you don't really need to show that for more than one. If, if it happens one time, that disqualifies it as a function. Sorry, my computer's going kind of slow here, so I'm having to wait for my computer to catch up. Okay, in the next one, it doesn't look like we have any problems, but uh, and actually in the, the next one, we no problems there also. So the last two uh, columns, they, they can possibly be uh, functions. We don't know for sure that they're functions, but we can't disqualify them based on that evidence. Okay, so I'm going to leave 17 in the window. I want you to try number 18, see if you can find any of those relations in the columns and, and try to disqualify them. Again, what you're looking for is numbers in the x column that are sent are the same. If you find negative 4 and negative 4, for example, up there, you see how it's the same for both of those, so that disqualifies it, so you have to circle it. That can't be a function. So that's what you're looking for. Look for numbers in the x column that, ha that are the same, and that disqualifies it. So try number 18, circle all the ones that, are, that cannot be functions, all the relations that cannot be functions, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So it doesn't look like the first table is disqualified, but the second one is because we have negative 7 twice in the x column. And what else do we have here? It doesn't look like the second table is disqualified, but this one we have 9. I can see 9 is twice there. So uh, looks like uh, those were the, table, the relations that were disqualified. So if you got those answers, good job. Go ahead and try number 19. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. Um, let's see here. 56 and 56 appear twice in the X column. And we have uh, all, we have eight, 8 appearing twice, and we also have 3 appearing twice in the x column. So that means if you plug in 3, you get two outputs for that same input, and that's not allowed. That can't be a function. So we uh, circled those. So if you got those answers, good job. Um, now, I want to warn you. See the purple here? If different inputs produce the same output in an expression, for example, uh, this here, then this does not disqualify the expression from being a function. So this can be kind of confusing. I'm warning you. This can be kind of confusing for the mind to remember this. So what this means is if you plug in 
this input and you get 64, but you also plug in this input, this input, a different input, and you also get 64. You get the same output for different inputs. So this is going to be kind of confusing. Um, if you plug in negative 8 to this function, it produces 64, right? But if you plug in positive 8, a different input, that also gives you the same output. That's completely fine. You can still be a function. It can still be a function in that case. I know this is getting kind of confusing, but just to go back here, if you plug in one input and you get two different outputs, it cannot be a function. So for these examples, you plug in one input, you plug in five over here, and you get two different outputs. So you're, pl you're, you're plugging in only one input and getting two different outputs. That's not allowed. That can't be a function. But if you plug in two different inputs and you get the same output for those two different inputs, this, this example, that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of students see this situation and they, they think that disqualifies it as a function. It actually doesn't. So let's do some examples here. Um, now, I made these tables horizontal just because, you know, we need to get used to horizontal tables also. But it's the same problems we did before. So um, we're looking for, um, we're trying to, again, we're trying to disqualify these as uh, a function. So we're looking for an X column where all the, where there's numbers in the X are the same. So looks like over here, you see these, um, you see these fives, negative five and negative five. So that disqualifies it as a function. So we're going to circle that. I think that's about it. I don't see anything else. But here's the point. Down here, you see these these twos? You have two of them. So a lot of students would say, well, we can disqualify that. But that's in the Y. That's in the Y row. You see? So what this means is you plug in 6, and you get 2 as an output. But you plug in a different number, 0, and you also get 2 as an output. That's OK. That's perfectly fine. If you see. Uh, duplicate numbers in the Y row or Y column if we're doing vertical columns, then that's okay. It doesn't disqualify it as a function. Same thing over here. We got, if we plugged in negative 3, negative 8, and positive 9, and if we plug in 13, we get 1 for all of those. That's perfectly fine. It's okay to plug in different inputs and get the same output. I know, again, I know that's kind of confusing, but uh, that's important to understand. So what, do you, what, what are we supposed to take away from this? What is the take-home message? The take-home message is uh, a relation only is disqualified if there are uh, duplicate x's. If you, in the x column, or in this case, in the, the x row, because these are horizontal tables, if, the, if you have uh, a number that appears twice or three times or four times, in the X row, then it's disqualified. So here we have to disqualify because we have 10 in the X row uh, three times we have 10. So that disqualifies that. And what else do we have here? I don't see any other tables that are disqualified. Now you see over here, you see the blue over here, see all these eights? Again, a lot of people are going to say, well, that disqualifies it because it's you're, you're seeing the number more than once. But that's all happening in the Y, in the Y uh, column. You know, these X's are all different. So if the X's are all different, then it's not going to be, um, we're not going to uh, circle that one. It's not disqualified as a function. Uh, same thing here. Look at all these duplicate numbers in the, the Y column. But because they're in the Y column, it's not disqualified, you see. Uh, same thing here. We have zeros that are duplicates. We have threes that are duplicates. And we also have fours that are duplicates, you see. But none of that disqualifies this relation as a function because there's no numbers that are, appear more than once in the x row. OK, so now it's time for you to try some of those. Try number 22. Again, if x if the if a number appears more than once in the x uh, row, x row being this row here, the top one, then that you have to circle it. It disqualifies it as a function. So try number 22, and when you come back, we'll do it together. 
All right, we're back. Um, zero appears more than once. That disqualifies that as a function. Appears more than once in the x column. Seven appears more than once in the x column. And um, even though, even though uh, at the bottom right you see nine appears more than once, but that's the y column, so we don't care about that. So if you got that answer, good job. Um, I'm just double checking here, making sure I didn't miss anything. I think those are the only ones that are disqualified. So now try number 23, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So I see negative 5 in the x column, or x row. It appears more than once, so we have to disqualify that. So we circled that one. 3 appears more than once in this uh, column. And 8 appears more than once in this column, and also 12 and also 9, so that, that disqualifies that. But if you look at this over here, you see that 10 appears four times, but that's okay. Because it's just repeating in the Y column. You can, you can put a, a bunch of different inputs in and get the same output. That's completely fine. Again, I know this is kind of confusing, but you know all you have to know is if something appears more than once, in the x row or x column, that disqualifies it. We don't really care about what happens in the y in terms of repeating numbers. Okay, so now we're going to try, uh, if you got that problem right, good job. You circled three of those. So now um, we're going to have a slightly different situation here, but it's it's pretty much the same 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 deal, but sometimes they try to trick you. So you see we have seven here in the x row and we have seven here in the x row. So students would say, I guess that disqualifies it, right? Well, actually, no, they're trying to trick us. Seven appears twice, but look at the negative four. It's negative four in both of these. So that actually doesn't disqualify it because we're plugging in seven and we're only getting one output, negative four. So that's just a trick. And I know what you're thinking, why would why would teachers try to trick us like that? Well. The textbooks just do it all the time. That's more, The curriculum is designed to test students' ability to really understand what's going on. Now down here we have a similar situation. You see this? We have 10 and negative 10 and 10 and negative 10. So x appe 10 appears twice, but it gives us the same output. So that doesn't disqualify it. But we have 4 appearing twice. You plug in 4 and you get two different outputs, 2 and 3. That disqualifies it. So again, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, we're try I'm trying to trick you. Well, this is just what they do in the math curriculum, so you have to get ready for this type of stuff. Okay, so now here we see two of numbers that, that are the same in the x column, so we think that that's going to disqualify the relation, but you see they both produce 9. So you're plugging in an input, and you only have one output, so that does not disqualify it. So um, we cannot... Uh, circle that one. All right, so let's try one more of these before you try one on your own. So again, you just have to be careful. You have to have the same number in the x columns down here, but the y, the y, the output has to be uh, different. So we see negative seven twice, once here and once here, right? But it produces the same output, so that doesn't disqualify it. You plug in negative 7, you get the same number, negative 5. We see all kinds of numbers that are different, or, or excuse me, that are the same in the, in the y column, but that doesn't really make any difference because, remember, you can plug in a bunch of different inputs and get the same output. That's okay. It's not, you know, that's, that doesn't disqualify it. So over here, we have 11 appearing twice in, in, the, in the x uh, column, so we think that's going to disqualify it, but remember, that's kind of a trick. Negative 2 appears in both of these, so you plug in 11, you only get negative 2. So that was kind of a trick. That doesn't disqualify it. Here you plug in, you have you see 8's repeated a bunch of times, but it's a trick. You plug in 8, you only get 0, so that doesn't disqualify it. And over here we have 5 appearing twice in the x column, so we think that's going to disqualify it, but it doesn't, because you get 2 when you plug in 5 for both of those. Now, for 6, you plug in 6, you see 6 appears twice, but now you're getting a different output 
You get three when you plug in six, but you also get eight, so that disqualifies it as a function. So we have to circle that one. Okay, so now it's time for you to try. I'm going to leave 25 in the window and see if you can do number 26. Again, the whole point here is try to find um, numbers in the x rows that appear more than once and make sure that the output is different for each one of those. So try number 26, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, so you can see we have 16 appearing twice, but that doesn't disqualify it because the outputs are the same. They're both 9. So that can still be a function. Let's go down here. We have negative 3 appearing three times. And for all three times, there's a different output. You can't plug in one input and get three different outputs. So that disqualifies it as a function. So we have to circle that one. And up here, we have negative 3 appearing twice. But that's OK, because the output is the same for both of them. You plug in negative 3, you only get 7. So that doesn't disqualify that one. Um, down here, we have negative 6 appearing three times. And these two are the same. They're both 14. So you plug in negative 6, you only get 14. So that doesn't disqualify it. But if you plug in negative 6 here, it says we get 14. So that, or that we get 15. So you can't get 14 and 15 for the same input. So that disqualifies it. This stuff is very confusing. It can be very confusing, but if you want to simplify this in your mind, all you have to remember is that if you see x more than one time, then it's possible that it's going to be disqualified. But just to, to confirm that it's disqualified, you have to make sure the outputs are different for the same inputs. So that's disqualified. So if you got those answers, good job. Also, remember, we see that numbers are repeated. Sorry about that. It just threw me over there for no reason. We see that the um, the outputs, we have multiple outputs for some of these. Um, for example, over here, you see this, we have 4 and 4. But that doesn't disqualify it, because those are in the output column, the y column. It only is a possible disqualifier if the, the, the number is repeated in the, the x uh, row. So go ahead and try 27, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So um, 10 is repeated, but 7 uh, is the output for both those. And 14 is repeated, but 7 is the output for both those. And so it looks like that one's OK. And 3 is repeated down here, and the outputs are, are different. So if you plug in 3, you get two different outputs. That's not allowed, so that cannot be a function. And over here, we have 0 appearing twice, but 16 is the output for both those. And I guess that one, uh, that one qualifies. Here we have 8 appearing twice, but 15 is the output for both. And we have negative 5 appearing twice, but... Um, we have uh, different outputs. So you have um, two outputs for the same input. So that's not allowed. So that would not be a function. That, that's disqualified. So if you got that answer, good job. OK, so we have one more thing to cover here regarding functions. There are three ways to represent a function. We've showed equa equations. That's where you have something like this, f of x is equal to x squared minus 5, something like that. That's um, using an equation. And we've showed functions represented with uh, tables. That's the problems that we did previously. But you can also represent a function with a graph. Remember, a graph is just a set of ordered pairs. So you have a point on the graph, for example, and you have an x value and a y value for each point. And if a, if a, a graph is um, produced from a function, then your input is the x value, and your uh, output is the y value. And we've studied various graphs in my previous courses. We studied lines. And uh, in this course, we studied parabolas. Those graphs are all uh, sets of ordered pairs. but uh, 
what we're going to find is that some of those graphs can be graphs of functions and other uh, graphs can only be uh, uh, graphs of relations that you can't really call them functions. So here's some examples of graphs of functions. So we're going to look at graphs of relations and uh, determine which relations cannot be functions. So let's say that you plug in some input. Sorry, we won't call it an input. We'll just call it an x value because we don't know if it's a relation or a, a function. So you plug in some, some x value here, right? You only get one y value, that y value there on this particular uh, relation. But over here, let's say you plug in an x value, you plug in this x value here. Well, now you've got this y value, but you've also got this y value. So if you interpret that in terms of functions, you plug in an input here, and then you get one output. But if you plug in one input here, for example, you get two outputs. So that cannot qualify um, as a function. So what we do is we draw vertical lines. If you can draw a bunch of vertical lines, any vertical lines, and you only touch once, then uh, the graph is uh, the graph of a function. But if you draw vertical lines over here and you see they're touching twice, you only have to draw one vertical line where, where it touches more than once. And that uh, disqualifies this relation as a function. So what we just described is something called the vertical line test. If any vertical line touches a graph more than once, then the graph cannot be a function. So it's pretty simple. So we'll go ahead and circle that, because that cannot be a function. But this graph over here, that can be a function because it passed the vertical line test. It only The vertical lines only touch once. Whereas the vertical lines over here, they touch the red graph more than once. Now let's do the vertical line test here. Doesn't matter where we draw the vertical lines, it only touches the graph once. So that can be a function. Um, so let's do the vertical line test here. You can see that if we do a vertical, vertical line, it touches in a lot of places there. So that cannot be, um, I don't know why I used orange up here. That cannot be a function. So we're going to circle that one. And if we do a vertical line anywhere around that region, we see that that cannot be a function because it touches more than once. If we use vertical lines here, it only, it only touches the red graph once in all the parts, so that can be a function. Okay, um, let's try one more of these before you try one on your own. So if we do vertical lines on that graph, it only touches once, so that's okay. Vertical lines here, it only touches once. I think you've got the point here. And this is kind of a weird one, but you see how these whole these dots are, are filled in here, but they're not filled in here. That, that means that if you draw a vertical line through there, it's only touching once. I know that's kind of complicated. We haven't seen that yet, but this passes the vertical line test because it only touches once in all places. If there was, if there was a filled in dot, I know it's kind of confusing, but if there were a filled in dot there, then it would touch twice. You plug in an input and it would give you two outputs. It, would, it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. So that was kind of a challenge problem. Um, so all those are, are uh, can be uh, function or graphs of functions. So why don't you go ahead and try 31. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So these two cannot be uh, functions because if you draw a vertical line through this you can see it's you know we we have uh, the vertical line uh, touching two places same here draw vertical lines through there and they're touching in two places um, it only happen it only has to happen once to disqualify it from uh, being a function so try number 32 and when you come back we'll do it together all right we're back if you draw a vertical line you can see it touches a bunch of different places, so that cannot be the graph of a function. For this one, you can draw a bunch of vertical lines, and you can see it's only going to touch once. And 
for the next graph, same thing. So that's that's a, a function, or the graph of a function. So now try 33, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So this one is a little a little tricky here. I, I think you can see if you draw a vertical line here, it touches more than one. So that was tricky, but uh, we do have to circle that. That cannot be the graph of a function. Here we can draw plenty of vertical lines. It only touches once. And this one was kind of a trick problem. All you have to do is draw one vertical line right through this red, and it touches in a, a you know, an infinite number of places. So that definitely does not pass the vertical line test. It might look like it will pass because you're not touching anything over here. But if you do a, if you draw a, a red line right over there, it's going to touch in a bunch of different places. So that cannot be a function. So anyway, if you got those right, good job. So that was the class today. If you want to take pictures of all the work that we did to help you with your homework or to study for tests, go ahead and do that now. Screenshot number one. Screenshot number two. And screenshot number three. And number four. And number five. And number six. And number seven. And number eight. And number nine. But don't go before you get your homework. Let's look at the homework. Get a screenshot of these two pages. And a screenshot of these two pages. And don't forget to get the answers here. Remember, it's not enough to just attempt the homework, it has to be correct. So check those answers. And remember the homework has to be neat, complete, correct, and in proper order in your binder. And if you don't do that homework, it's 100% guarantee you're going to learn nothing in this course. So get that homework done, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next class.